Hello, good, good morning. My name is Ben Fryer, and I am a researcher at the University of Washington Heart Regeneration Program, which is uh, part of the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine. I'd like to thank Karen Mueller and, and uh, Yukari Tokiyama for the invitation to speak today. And I'll be talking today about manufacturing uh, clinical-grade cell therapy from, from published research method, methods. And some of the, the uh, key questions and, and um, details that I think have to be addressed when you're developing a cell therapy, for, especially from a research uh, process. So going forward, uh, the outline of what I'll talk about today is some of the work that m me and my team have been working on in terms of manufacturing a preclinical grade, toxicology grade uh, cell therapy material, um, and the, a little bit of the background of, of what we thought about when we were we were beginning the process um, and looking at the, you know the unmet need uh, for this and the proof of concept work. Um, this is all work that has been done um, by Chuck Murray and his lab and uh, some of his collaborators. Uh, this is a, essentially a process that Chuck has driven for probably the last 20 years. And uh, right now the culmination of a lot of his hard work has been to develop the heart regeneration program, which I work for. Um, looking at that process and the unmet need that we, we feel is out there to, to treat heart disease, um, we thought we should plan and map the process, and that really starts with a core principle of chemistry, manufacturing, con and controls, uh, CMC, and then the regulatory guidance, uh, both from the International Committee on Harmonization and the FDA. Um, for people who are in Japan or, or the Europe, there would be the EMEA and, and the Japanese regulatory uh, guidance, but uh, for us and for today, I'll be talking about the FDA. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the ideal biomanufacturing process that has been developed for uh, large-scale molecule processing and production um, for monoclonal antibodies and, and proteins, and then applying that to our cell therapy process, and then looking really at the, at the dosing and the process scale requirements we'll need to be able to manufacture a cell therapy um, to meet our demands as our demands grow from uh, preclinical to phase one, phase two, phase three, and hopefully eventually commercial uh, manufacturing and how that would relate to GMP manufacturing, good manufacturing, practice manufacturing. And, uh, and then I close with a couple slides with some references on regulation and, and guidance for developing uh, an aseptic uh, cell therapy process for manufacturing. So uh, open with the obligatory uh, slide to, to show why we're working on this process and, and why we're working with cardiomyocytes and why Chuck has spent so much time and effort um, to develop this, this program. And that is because heart disease is the number one killer in the world. Um, it, it causes one in four deaths, and about uh, just over half a million people every year have a first heart attack, and over 200,000 every year have a recurrent or second or more uh, infarct. And once you have a, a heart attack, you are likely to progress to heart failure, and that, that progression can be blocked and treated by a standard of care that's pretty good, um, and I've listed a lot of the, the, the treatments that are available both by drug, surgery, and, and device to, to, to slow that progression. But once you progress to heart failure, there's not a lot of options, and uh, the mortality rate is uh, pretty high. Um, within five years, many patients die of heart failure. And so once you've, had, uh, once you've been diagnosed with heart failure, you're likely to need uh, an LVAD, a left ventricular assist device, which really just bridges you until you're available or, or can get a, a heart transplant. Unfortunately, though, since 1990, so over the last 25 or more years, really the rate of, of heart transplants have not, have not gone up much, which means about 1% of all the patients who are eligible to get a heart transplant actually get one, which means most patients actually die of heart failure. Um, while sitting on a transplant list, which means there's a really large unmet need to treat um, severe heart failure. And so looking at that, we began to develop um, a process to, to treat these. And this is Chuck's um, uh, seminal paper from uh, June of 2014 that was published in Nature, showing that human embryonic stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes could, could engraft and regenerate a non-human primate heart. And on the left here in the panel, you can see that the white border zone is the area where the, the surgically induced or mechanically induced um, heart attack occurred. And the dark area is where there's no cells inside the, the, the white uh, dashed line. The green cells are the human cells that are cardiomyocytes that were injected into the infarct zone. 
and engrafted and aligned with the recipient. So the red is alpha-actinin, which is heart protein, um, both monkey and human, and then the green and yellow tissue is the human heart cells that engrafted with the, the, the monkey heart. And they beat synchronously with, the, with the, the, the host after some recovery time, and they are fully synchronized um, and uh, conjugated to the, the recipient heart. You can see in the top right panel, and in the bottom right panel, you can see that the the non-human primate um, vascular supply is, is invaded in and supplies um, nutrients and oxygen to the, the grafted tissue. So this is uh, and was a very exciting uh, data. It was a it was a I think a momentous discovery, and it showed that it was possible uh, through proof of concept to to develop and potentially uh, treat uh, myocardial infarction and, and and heart disease with a cell therapy. But the process that was used to to get to manufacture that research process or research um, material was a, a difficult and, and laborious process that involved adherent expansion and differentiation, um, a lot of man hours and a lot of uh, uh, cell culture plastic. Uh, in this case, they used T150 peel flasks, and they required about uh, 20 T150 flasks per per dose. Uh, the differentiation window was about 16 to 20 days. Of differentiation after um, several weeks of expansion, and in the end, just to get the cells off and prepare them for cryopreservation and delivery to to the uh, to the to the animal subject, took about 18 person hours per dose, and that's not including all the differentiation and expansion time. It was all done in a standard uh, laboratory laminar hood, a biosafety cabinet, and there were several lines that were used: uh, the H7 and, and the Rockefeller University ES line two, Ruis two. Um, that both had transgene insertions of a, of a, a calcium-driven GFP reporter, a GCAMP3. Um, it was delivered in the AAVS1 locus. So as we look at this and we begin to think, how could we take this process and convert it into a clinical grade, we, we start with really guidance um, that would be standard to any sort of biological process that you're manufacturing for for clinical use or intended uh testing in human beings, and that starts with chemistry manufacturing and controls, also known as CMC. And CMC is responsible for manufacturing bulk drug substance and the final drug product. Um, in this case, the bulk drug, su drug substance would be the cells, um, but before they are prepared for cryopreservation and thawing, the final drug product would actually be the cryopreserved, thawed, um, washed, and, and loaded um, product that would be delivered to a patient. Uh, as part of this, you need to make sure that you understand that how your cells are made and what they will be like, what they will look like as um, they're ready for uh, either preparation for final drug product or preparation for delivery to a patient. And that involves setting your product specifications and release criteria so that you know what you can accept, what you can't accept, and how consistent your manufacturing process is. And that involves um, understanding it. Uh, the other thing that comes up is these are cells that will be cryopreserved, like most cell therapies. The ideal cell, cell therapy is, is cryopreserved, and that means that you need to understand your product stability, and you have to have analytical methods that are qualified, validated, and robust that can detect any differences in a lot-to-lot -lot, uh, process. And as all of this work then goes into a CMC section that's submitted to uh, any sort of regulatory agency, whether in the U.S. or, or international. And as part of all of this, there, there can, of course, be sometimes failures in the process, and CMC involves understanding that and correcting those so that they don't happen again. And as part of the CMC, you expect as you go from preclinical, phase one, on to phase three, and finally commercial, that you will have um, a, a more complex process. And so that means that you have to be able to understand how to uh, change your manufacturing as you grow with the process. So... The guidance that we use, um, uh, starting off, this is, I think, one of the key pieces of guidance that is, is applicable to anybody who's working in this field. You work with uh, the FDA. You want to know that, that what their guidance is. And so we work with, uh, with this document, Preclinical Assessment of Investigational Cellular and Gene Therapy Products. It's uh, recently released from the FDA in November 2013, and the link is below if you're interested. And the the key aspect of any sort of cell therapy begins with the cells. And the cells that you're going to use, especially if you're doing an allo, allogeneic cell therapy, meaning one uh, genetic individual being used uh, to, to treat um, many different people, 
you need to have donor consent. Donor consent is critical, and it's critical for any sort of development process because you need to be able to know that you can use those cells um, for any sort of potential research and therapeutic use, and if you develop a product that's successful enough, it would be used for commercial application. And it's not possible uh, or not easily possible to go back and get written and legally valid informed consent when you're far into the process. You need to have it up front, and that means that your donors have to have fully understood um, and been informed of what it means to give the material. So it could either be uh, in the case of an IPS cell or bone marrow, it could be an adult, or in the case of um, IPS cells or ESLs, it could be parents that are, that are they're donating the tissue, but you need to make sure that you have fully informed consent. Um, so as you look at the ideal um, allogeneic cell therapy bioprocess. Uh, it follows the, the process that's been developed for large molecules, uh, monoclonal manu manufacturing, and that is to say you work with a, start with a master cell bank. The master cell bank is oftentimes about 100 or 200 vials, and then each one of those vials in the master cell bank can be used to work, to make a working cell bank, and you get about 100 to 200 vials. So then each working cell bank vial is used to generate one product lot. So doing the math, if you say you've got 100 master cell bank vials and you've got 100 working cell bank vials per master cell bank vial, uh, that gives you about 10,000 potential product lots. And if you're manufacturing, let's say, uh, 10, 10 uh, product lots a year, each one from a, from a working cell bank vial, that would give you 1,000 years of product. Um, probably not necessary, but you can see that following that process gives you sufficient uh, safety margin that you could make your product to, to meet the needs for a long time going forward. Each working cell bank vial is then used to generate uh, the product lot that starts with seed material. Seed material is the expansion part, and then that, um, once you finish with the expansion, you can do uh, the differentiation, in our case, making cardiomyocytes. And those would be the product cells. Uh, the product cells then have to be enzymatically dissociated, um, washed, cryopreserved, and then uh, that gives you finally, hopefully, a well-characterized product that can be used to develop potency assays for your phase three and commercial product. Um, ideally, all of this uh, work can be done with an off-the-shelf single-use technologies. Uh, in the past, a lot of a lot of biomanufacturing was done with uh, stainless steel reactors or glass reactors, but people are moving to to, to plastic bag systems or uh, stackable systems. Um, and those systems um, are all termed uh, ancillary materials. Ancillary materials covers a, a wide range of products, but that would be anything that touches the cell but doesn't actually go into the patient directly. So any sort of cryovials, uh, the media itself, any growth factors or small molecules which falls into the field of morphogens um, that you would add, uh, insulin, et cetera. Um, the culture wire itself, any tubes, bags, um, all those things are ancillary materials, and you want to make sure that that is a, a high-quality cell therapy grade or GMP, if possible, material. And this process um, that you develop, ideally you want it to be something that can be scaled so that you can meet your, your commercial or phase three needs. Uh, the FDA uh, requests that, that your phase three process be the one that you lock for any sort of commercial manufacturing. So any changes you need to make to the process, you want to be able to make them before you get to phase three. And the, I think, uh, the other thing that you want to make sure you've, you've got in this process is that it's something that can be closed, meaning you don't work over open containers, that you use tubing sets, things can be pumped from, from vessel to vessel. And ideally, uh, a, a common failure point in any sort of development of a, of a cell therapy is the tech transfer or technical transfer to a GMP, uh, good manufacturing process plant. And um, so you want to make it as, as simple as possible because the more simple, the more likely it will succeed on the transfer. So as we began to look at preparing for our IND and clinical testing, we thought, well, what about the process, the method that we're using to make these cardiomyocytes and expand the ESLs? Uh, what kind of changes would we need to make to the materials? What kind of dose are we looking at? Um, could we scale out the process, meaning add more plastic, or could we scale up, meaning go into suspension? Um, where would we manufacture this? And then looking at that process of, of, of scale out, scale up, manufacturability, um, where would could we develop a process that would have comparability, meaning the process we use for preclinical in phase one would be something that could be uh, comparable even if it was scaled in our manufacturing for any sort of phase three or commercial process. And making sure that on the beginning um, we work with reputable vendors 
that would be able to support us with GMP materials throughout the process. So our projected cell, cell requirement based on extrapolation of, of sizing from small rodents all the way up to non-human primates, we project that we would need about a billion cells per dose, 10 to the ninth cells per dose. And our study capacity for our preclinical and toxicology model would need at least 15, if not more, large animal subjects and multiple small animal subjects to meet our preclinical supporting, IND supporting documentation and our toxicology studies. So if we do the math, um, given the older adherent culture model, um, where they needed, uh, by, by, by just math, about 2,000 square centimeters, but practically about 3,000 square centimeters, or 20 times T1, 20 T150 flasks uh, per dose, that's really not extrapolatable if you need to get just even through a phase one trial where you'd need over 100,000 uh, square centimeters of culture surface. Um, so thinking, keeping in mind the idea of comparability and that our, our process should be uh, something that we plan to use throughout, um, we decided that suspension culture would be required. So looking at that and kind of like thinking about the critical constraints of any sort of ancillary materials that you're, you're working with, you want to convert to clinical grade uh, materials as early as possible. Uh, reduce anything that isn't required, or refine the process so that you get as clean and, um, and good of, of, of ancillary materials as possible, and replace anything that's not, not ready for prime time um, manufacturing. So for example, if you work through this, this list, you can see if you've got multiple cell lines, you're gonna have to select one, that, that single line, whether it's a mesenchymal or a stromal cell or an IPS line or an ES line, it all has to come from a single uh, allogeneic source, and it has to be clean. So you want to make sure your seed, your seed material is clean. When you're looking at moving to, from let's say a culture flask to something larger, there's lots of reputable vendors, but you want to work with one that can meet your needs. Uh, there's Paul, Sartorius, Corning, Nunk, but uh, begin working with them as soon as possible. When you look at the media needs, um, the process initially used condition media, um, that is cells, uh, converting the media to a functional format and then applying that to another set of cells. But in this case, you want to make sure that you, you, you get away from that because that's too complicated, uh, ideally using something like a defined commercially available media from a large reputable vendor. And I've got a few listed here. Um, if you've got growth factors, if you can swap them out for small molecules or drugs, that's, that's uh, wise. And if you do have to use growth factors, you ideally want them to be made with a xeno-free uh, process, uh, usually human recombinant expression, and there's actually several uh, large vendors that can meet that need. If you've got complex supplements, um, it's wise to reduce the, 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 try and identify what are the critical components in that, that, that supplement that you need, because all the complexity of that supplement can come back and bite you at, at the end of the process when uh, there's potentially any sort of supply chain disruption for that, that supplement. And so if the supplement has, say, 22 components in it and one of those components has a problem, you end up without having any of your, your, your supplements. So if you can find out how to get rid of uh, any sort of complex supplements, it's wise. And then in terms of your, just your process, you want to make sure that you make it as simple as possible, uh, reduce any sort of manipulations that are extraneous so that you don't have as much uh, human uh, manpower time associated with it and make sure it's, it's standard. So uh, any sort of harvest windows, you want to try and make it as, as small as possible. Um, in our case, when we started to think about where we were going to manufacture our product, we uh, are lucky because here at the University of Washington and here in Seattle, we have the Institute for Translational Health Sciences. They have several GMP uh, facilities and the one we're working with is the Gene and Cell Therapy Lab at the University of Washington. Uh, they work, uh, the, this facility is, is in the actual University of Washington Medical Center in the hospital, and it's 2,200 square feet, has four independent ISO 7 suites with uh, uh, ISO 5 biosafety cabinets in them. And the, one of the things that's nice about this is they have person and plant GMP capability. So in this picture, you can see a couple people in hoods. Those are actually uh, heart regeneration program employees who are, are are person and plant operators who can actually operate in the facility have been trained by um, the gene and cell therapy lab personnel to, to, to gown and to follow GMP and to actually take the process in and work in their facility. And uh, once the product is made in the facility by um, our GMP operators, it can then be used to treat patients in the same building and in the same system so that there's not um, site to site variability or, or any sort of shipping or transfer associated with the early studies in this process. 
Um, when you're going into GMP manufacturing, there's a few really uh, interesting things that come up, and one of them is that you need to have uh, good PPE and uh, gowning. Um, this is uh, both to protect the product and also protect the operator, and so that you can kind of understand exactly if there's any sort of contamination, which there shouldn't be, but if there is, where it's coming from. Oftentimes um, in, in facilities, uh, when it's a rainy season or winter or spring, any time when the, the weather is, is un, unsettled, spores can get in, um, as anybody who's done cell culture knows, um, and this is the kind of uh, protective um, gear that can keep that from happening. Um, when you're working in the facility, it's something that's like slightly different than, than working in a normal uh, biosafety cabinet is that you have actually in-process monitoring, both um, for any sort of viable particles, which would be you can use settling plates and agar plates to detect that, and also any sort of uh, particle counts to determine just what the, the, the total, whether they're viable or non-viable particles, are, are, are in the atmosphere. And you can keep, you can keep those low in a, in a GMP facility and reduce any sort of risk of contamination of your product. And then finally, I think one of the key things that as you move into GMP, especially as you're looking at your raw materials, is you begin to understand your manufacturing and supply chain a lot better. Um, and that comes from uh, having to meet material specifications, uh, following any sort of uh, manufacturing changes that your, your manufacturer or your suppliers are, 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 are making, and uh, under following any sort of expiration dates that are set by the manufacturer. Oftentimes, in a research lab, you'll have a process and it works great, and, and then a couple weeks later, it doesn't work so well. Or it works well with one operator, it doesn't work well with another operator. Um, and you never know exactly why. Uh, the, the interesting thing about moving to GMP is you begin to understand uh, that a lot of these kind of variability that you see in the process is often due to um, expired materials. Um, the media expires. The growth factors are taken out of a freezer and left in a fridge for a couple of weeks, and they degrade in, in aqueous solution sitting at four degrees. Um, the, the cell culture plastic uh, has gotten old. <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. Um, these are things that happen in, in, in the research process, but you try to, to get rid of those uh, variables in your GMP manufacturing process. Um, so after all that, what we're looking at in terms of our planned process for manufacturing cardiomyocytes for, for preclinical and, and human studies is to follow that, that classical biomanufacturing modular process that I described earlier in the talk. And that is you start with a, a master cell bank vial. Um, you generate a working cell bank. You take that working cell bank vial and you expand it to make one lot of product and starts with a what we call a seed train, but that is uh, expanding up the cells. And then your product is then made from that expanded cell. And the differentiation occurs in suspension. Uh, we make clusters of cardiomyocytes, and those clusters then have to be enzymatically treated to pull them apart and make a single cell suspension, which can then be washed, cryopreserved, and stored until it's needed for uh, delivery to a patient. At that point, the vial can be thawed. Um, the product, the cells can then be washed and loaded into a delivery device and uh, loaded into a catheter for delivery to the, the patient. So these are the clusters. Um, you can see the clusters here are about a uh, couple hundred microns in diameter, and each cluster contains about a thousand cells. And the interesting thing about working with cardiomyocytes is about eight or nine days into the process, most of the clusters begin to beat. And so it's a, kind of a, an interesting thing to watch uh, something living actually begin moving um, that um, is going to be used to treat a patient. So. Uh, it's one of my favorite parts of this job. So in closing, I just have a couple uh, slides where I talk about the resources that we use and that I'd like to, to put out there for anybody else who's interested in learning more about how to convert from a, from a research manufacturing process into a, a clinical grade manufacturing process. It starts with just understanding GMPs by FDA guidance, and that's uh, 21 CFR Part 210 and 211, and then guidance on, on more specifically how to make biological products, and that would be Part 600. 600. There's also lots of good ICH guidance, um, both Q5, uh, 6, and 7, um, for making pharmaceutical ingredients. And then there's FDA guidance for making aseptic processes, um, cell and tissue therapies, and then finally FDA guidance on, on CMC for any sort of somatic cell therapy. And uh, on the next page, I, I just 
laid out a few of the USP chapters that are available for anybody interested in understanding um, how to evaluate risk and qualify materials that they plan to use um, in their cell or uh, gene therapy manufacturing process. Um, specifically, if you plan to use any sort of cytokine or bovine serum, FBS, um, these are very uh, useful chapters, 1024 for, for, for bovine serum, and then FBS quality attributes, which is chapter 90. And then if you're going to use any sort of cytokines or growth factors, chapter 92 is relevant. So uh, in closing, I've told you a little bit about the Chuck Murray's um, heart regeneration program here at the University of Washington that uh, is now working hard to develop a cell therapy to treat heart disease. And the process that I've been working on um, as part of Chuck's program to convert from the research process to a clinical grade process and how we're uh, trying to make sure that we convert everything to GMP cell therapy grade to develop a product for treatment of, of heart disease, um, starting first with uh, toxicology studies to get approval, and then once hopefully we have approval to begin clinical studies. The team that works on this and that has developed all this is led, of course, by, by Chuck, um, but the other directors that are involved with the heart regeneration program are Rob McClellan and, and Scott Thies, and then the rest of the team that works on this, Stephanie Tuck, is in charge of preclinical regula regulatory is led by Erica Johnlin, and then the staff are listed here. And we also are lucky enough to work with an extremely talented team at the Gene and Cell Therapy Lab, which is our GMP facility, which is led by Donovan Ferris, and then Clarence Ahair are several of the scientists that work in that lab. So I'd like to thank everybody for their time and their attention today. Um, and if you wish to contact me, you can find me on LinkedIn or at, uh, at the University of Washington. I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody uh, views this deck and would like to learn more about the program or any sort of the details of, of this work. So thank you all very much.